So the last function we need to look at is the biconditional. Now remember, the biconditional is a conjunction of reversed conditionals, meaning that the final output is just a two-way conditional relationship. And what that means is that there's going to be an extra false. Remember that the conditional is false only when P is true and Q is false, but the biconditional is false also when Q is true and P is false. So I've reversed the letters there because we have that same conditional relationship going from Q to P, the same as we do from P to Q. So it's true when both are true, and it's true when both are false for the same reason that you don't really have any reason to claim that someone lied to you. If both your statements are false, then there's nothing wrong with what they said. They didn't lie to you, it's just that the statement isn't really relevant. However, if one is true and the other is false, then that actually does mean the biconditional will come out as being false. So from here we can go to any level. We can expand to statements that have three or more simple statements. And as long as we remember that if the compound statement has x simple statements, then the truth table will have two to the power of x lines. So here, if it is not true that it is Monday or Thursday, then I will go swimming after school. We can symbolize this as if not M or T, then S. So here we have three simple statements. How many lines will the truth table have? So it'll have eight lines. Here they are. And what you'll see on the left is we've done the same as in the less complex truth table. We've just done an extra level. First, we start off with all the trues and all the falses together for statement M. And that's four of each. And then we split statement T. And first, for the trues in statement M, we have true, true, false, false. So there are two times when you will have true and true for M and T. And then you will have two times when you have true and false for M and T. And then in the bottom half, we repeat that with the four false columns for M. And that means you will have two times where M is false and T is true. And then you will have two times where M is false and T is false. And to work out the difference between those two times, then we put in the S column, where we just alternate true and false all the way down. True, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. And in this way, we can very quickly work out that we have definitely got all of the options. So if we look on the other side now, I've color coded the statements so you can see which order we do things. And the first thing we would do if we wanted to be thorough is right in the columns for M and T again. So you can see that I've copied them there simply from the left. And then what do we do next? Well, the least dominant connective here is the disjunction, the red disjunction, because it's in brackets. So we put M and T in a disjunction, and that's what we get. We get true, 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 false, false. So next though, the green negation comes in and we have to negate that entire column, leaving us with six falses and two trues. And our final relationship is the conditional. So we'll just fill in column S here, which is, as we see, true, false, true, false, true, false, true, false. And now we're doing a conditional between the green column, which is the total truth output of the left-hand side, and the blue column, which is the output statement S. And if we do that, we can see that they are all true, except for the last one. In the last case, that is the only time where a true antecedent leads into a false consequent. And that is the only time when the conditional pops out a false truth value. So that is an example of a statement that involves three simple statements. But the process is exactly the same no matter how many you are doing. 
So, we just need to move on and talk about a couple of basic ideas which we will need before we look at our final and rather rushed section on arguments. So, a contradiction and a tautology are two argument ideas. A tautology is a statement which is always true, no matter what the truth values of the input statements are. So, no matter what you have, P is true, Q is false, P is false, Q is true, or anything, the output of your statement is always true. A contradiction is the opposite. It's always false, no matter what the truth values of the input statements are. So we'll look mostly at tautologies because those are what we're looking for when we want to make a valid argument. Something where the logic is true even if some of the input statements are false. And if somebody agrees with that and they agree with our premises, the start of our argument, well then they have to really accept the argument overall. So another topic we're going to run over very quickly and really does deserve more time is logical equivalence. So we looked at the biconditional and we discussed how it establishes a two-way truth relationship. So if that biconditional leads us to a tautology, which a simple biconditional does not, but if there are complex statements on both sides, then they might end up giving a tautology. Well, in this case, we would call the two statements logically equivalent. They have the same truth values under all circumstances. So there are other ways to create equivalent statements, such as with De Morgan's Law, which is a three-step process. First, we negate the entire statement. We negate each simple statement in the disjunction and conjunction. And then finally, we change the disjunction to a conjunction or vice versa. So by using this three-step process, we can show that not P and Q is equivalent to not P or not Q. Now you might think that it's equivalent to not P and not Q, but under some circumstances, we have to do something slightly different when we're dealing with logic. So let's just have a quick look at that example of De Morgan's Law. We start with this statement, not P and Q, and then we negate the whole statement, giving us a simple conjunction. We negate each simple statement, so it's not P and not Q, which might seem to be the obvious answer. But finally, we have to convert the conjunction to a disjunction, giving us not P or not Q. Now, as I said, this might not be your first guess, but it does make intuitive sense. When you think about the first statement, all it's really saying is not both, not P and Q together. That's all it's saying. It does not say definitely neither. It is not the same as not P and not Q because not P and not Q says definitely neither of them. However, not P or not Q gives us one or the other or neither. It does not give us the option of having both together. It is not both. So it's not one or not the other. So that is how De Morgan's Law works. Like I say, rather briefly, and you could certainly spend more time looking into it if you're interested. So finally, arguments. In everyday language, an argument is when two people are arguing. They're having a heated discussion about a situation. And in this case, it's because each person has their own ideas, sometimes quite strong ideas, about what is true and what is false in that situation. So in logic, an argument is a single organized idea. So it's like the opinion of one of those people. So an everyday argument happens when there is a disagreement in the logical arguments people have behind their ideas. Now, unfortunately, in everyday arguments, people aren't normally sitting down and thinking about the logic behind what they're saying. They tend to go on emotion 
and their own opinions without always sitting down and thinking about them that strongly. Maybe it would be a better world if they did. <laughs>